Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this, our joint service of worship. Now we're on the third Sunday in Lent, and as we've been journeying through Lent, we've already looked at scripture and meditation. This morning, Reverend Cheryl Patterson is going to guide our thoughts as we think around the subject of prayer. Well, it's great that we can come together as four distinct churches to worship together in God's name. There are two things that I want to bring to your attention. After this service, there will be a service of Holy Communion on Zoom that will begin at 11 o'clock. And again, just to bring your attention to our Lenten Bible study, which is happening on a Wednesday evening at 7.30. This is being led by various ministers from East Belfast. Already, Brian has led our thoughts on Mary Magdalene. Britt has led our thinking on Judas. And this Wednesday, ministerial student Jackie McNair will be looking at Peter. Everyone is very welcome to come along to that. But now we come to worship. Let's just take a moment to still our hearts, to prepare ourselves in silence to come before God. Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord my horn is lifted high, my mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. Let's worship. To the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is your health and salvation. Oh, you who hear, now to His temple draw near. Praise Him in glad adoration.
Let us pray. Gracious God, once more we meet together during this season of Lent. We come in the name of Christ, remembering again those lonely and testing days he endured in the wilderness. We come recalling how deliberately he spent time there alone, reflecting on who he was and what you wanted of him. We come reminded of the courage, the faith and the commitment he showed during that time. Qualities that were to characterise the rest of his ministry. Gracious God, help us to use this time given to us. May we draw closer to you through it, understanding more of your nature and our own. May it deepen our faith, strengthen our commitment and confirm our sense of calling. May we learn what it means to follow Christ and what it means to serve you. May we recognise more clearly the true cost of discipleship, but equally the rewards. May we understand more fully why you have put us here, what you would have us do, who you would have us be, how you would have us live, and where you would have us go. Gracious God, prepare us through this time of worship, this day and this season, to understand and celebrate more fully all you have done for us in Christ. And so may we love you more truly and serve you more faithfully. Loving God, we remember in this season of Lent the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, the pressures he faced, the choices he had to make, the evil he had to resist, the path he chose. We remember that though he was tempted as we are, he did not give way. Though he could have used his powers for his own ends, he used them instead for us. Though he could have taken the easy way, he took the hard. Loving God, forgive us that our testimony is all too often so different. We have failed you in so much, refusing to take up our cross and follow in the footsteps of Jesus. We have not obeyed your commandments or loved you as you have loved us or in any way lived faithfully as your people. We have been narrow in our vision, weak in our commitment, careless in our worship, self-centered in our attitudes, repeatedly preferring our way to yours and wandering far from you. Loving God, have mercy on us. Renew us in heart and mind and spirit. Strengthen our wills and deepen our faith. And send us out once more as your people forgiven and restored to live and work for you in the name of Christ, who taught us to pray together as a family saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading comes from Psalm 116 and is read from the Message Version. I love God because he listened to me, listened as I begged for mercy. 
He listened so intently as I laid out my case before him. Death stared me in the face. Hell was hard on my heels. Up against it, I didn't know which way to turn. Then I called out to God for help. Please God, I cried out, save my life. God is gracious. It is he who makes things right, our most compassionate God. God takes the side of the helpless. When I was at the end of my rope, he saved me. I said to myself, relax and rest. God has showered you with blessings. Soul, you've been rescued from death. I, you've been rescued from tears and you, foot, were kept from stumbling. I'm striding in the presence of God, alive in the land of the living. I stayed faithful though overwhelmed and despite a ton of bad luck, despite giving up on the human race saying they're all liars and cheats. What can I give back to God for the blessings he poured out on me? I'll lift high the cup of salvation, a toast to God. I'll pray in the name of God. I'll complete what I promised God I'd do. And I'll do it together with his people. When they arrive at the gates of death, God welcomes those who love him. O oh God, here I am, your servant, your faithful servant. Set me free for your service. I'm ready to offer the thanksgiving sacrifice and pray in the name of God. I'll complete what I promised God I'll do. And I'll do it in the company with his people, in the place of worship, in God's house, in Jerusalem, God's city. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay, so who knows what this is? This is my mobile phone. And I'm afraid to say it would be hard to live without it. We can do so many things with this. We can talk to people, we can text people, we can play games. Sometimes I even read books on my mobile. And a lot of people have these now. And I'm sure you've maybe played on your mum or your dad's or maybe your granny or your granda's. And this here, it has a built-in battery and it has to be recharged. It's really annoying when you're in the middle of a game and the battery runs out. It's so annoying. What do you have that maybe needs recharged? Maybe you have a tablet or maybe a laptop that needs to be recharged after you've done some schoolwork on it. Or maybe you have a switch and it needs recharged. But did you know that people need to recharge their batteries too? Maybe when we work really hard at school during the week or maybe we've had a football match or a netball match and we don't get enough rest. Pretty soon we just don't have enough energy to do the things that we need to do or the things that we want to do. We just get too tired and we need to be recharged. Even Jesus had to recharge and today we're going to learn how he did that. Jesus travelled all around Galilee. He was preaching, he was teaching, he was driving out demons. And he was healing people. One day Jesus and some of his disciples went to the home of Simon and Andrew and their mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. Jesus took her by the hand and helped her up. All at once the fever left her and she began to prepare a meal for everyone. Jesus had made her better. That evening Many people came to Jesus to be healed of all sorts of diseases. The whole town gathered at the door because they'd heard what happened and they wanted to watch. That must have been a really, really long day. Jesus got up before sunrise the next morning, that's really early, and he found a quiet place where he could pray and recharge his spirit. 
When Simon and the others woke up, they found him and said, everyone's looking for you. Jesus had recharged his batteries after a really long day and was ready to go. He said to them, let's go to other towns and villages so that I can preach to them too. That's what I came to do. So they traveled throughout Galilee and Jesus preached in the synagogues and healed people and cast out demons. Now, if Jesus thought it was important for him to recharge his spiritual battery, it's important for us to do that too. And that's why we need to spend time in prayer every day. It doesn't have to be really long prayers. It can be just short prayers. But how can we do that? First of all, we have to stop. Stop what we're doing so that we can pray. If we think of the stop sign that we see on roads, that can help us to pray. S means sorry. We can say sorry to God for some of the wrong things that we have done. T stands for thank you. We can thank God for all the things that he has done for us. O stands for others. We can say a prayer for other people. And P means please. And we can say a prayer for something that we want to see changed. So let's take some time to pray together now. Dear God, we are sorry for the times we make you sad because we have done something wrong. Help us to be more like Jesus. Thank you that we can talk to you in prayer, just like we are talking to our friends and we know that you listen. We pray for anyone who is sick at the minute and ask that you would be with them. Please help us all to be recharged this morning as we worship and pray to you. Amen.
Our New Testament reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, reading chapter 18, verses 1 to 8. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Luke's Gospel teaches us frequently about prayer. In it, we hear Jesus use stories and questions to teach his disciples how to pray. But why? Why was it important for Jesus to teach and to guide and to model prayer for his disciples? In Luke chapter 5, verse 16, we read that even though the attention on Jesus was vast and the need for him was plenty, that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places to pray. Uh, there was an importance in the relationship between Jesus and his heavenly father that called on this action, this attention and intention and devotion to prayer. Prayer did not take second place behind busyness or need. And while perhaps that's an important point for us to hear in the culture that we live in today, that prayer did not take second place behind busyness and need. Now prayer was not a new thing to the disciples, for rhythms of prayer were part of the Jewish heritage that they came from. Yet there was something about how Jesus modelled prayer that caught the attention of the disciples in a new way and they asked him to teach them how to pray. Perhaps they witnessed something in Jesus that they wanted to experience for themselves. Perhaps they saw the power of Jesus and thought, well, there must be some power in this model of prayer that he has. Perhaps they saw the difference in relationship that Jesus had with the Father and they wanted to possess a part of that relationship too. When we look at the parables or the points that Jesus makes around prayer, we see um, some hints of perhaps why the disciples' experience of prayer was not quite as it should be. As Jesus teaches them, he urges for this genuine intention that must lie at the heart of prayer. He expresses that prayer should be heart and not habit, that prayer should be founded on compassion, not self-gain. That words for prayers are not about intellectual prowess or correct formulas of speech, but that words are to be simple and sincere. He paints a picture that prayer beckons faith as we trust in God, a God who listens and who responds. Now, as I thought through all of these corrections that Jesus makes to the disciples' thinking or experience of prayer in their culture, well, I couldn't help be challenged about my own prayer life and to ask questions um, about heart over habit and compassion for others over self-interest. You see, the living word of God that we have before us, when we come to it, well, it has a way of intruding into our comfort and shaking us a little or maybe a lot. And although we rarely like to be shaken, um, these intrusive questions, will they call us into a life that resembles more of Christ and less of ourselves? So as we consider the practice of prayer today as part of this Lent journey of reflections, we want to invite God by his spirit um, to ask intrusive questions of us and of our prayer life. 
we invite him to call us deeper into the example of Christ and we ask him to expose any self-centeredness or any obstacles that we have placed in our path when it comes to prayer. And so may God enrich our prayer life that will in turn enrich our relationship with him. Now prayer, well it's such a vast topic for us to consider and this morning we could go in so many different directions. So we could consider our call to prayers of adoration and thanksgiving and how intentionally praising God invites our hearts and our hopes to be lifted as we dwell on God's goodness. We could consider our call to prayers of confession uh, that bring us in humility to remember that it is only by the grace of God that we can stand. We could think on this wonderful gift of intercession and how we have a privilege to stand in the gap for the needs of others and to plead to God on their behalf. We could also wrestle with prayer that is healing and deliverance. Um, and, and perhaps as we follow our Lent readings this week in our Lent book, those thoughts and questions will be prompted in us as we follow along in the coming week. But today though, I would like us to sit with this passage in Luke's Gospel that records the parable of the persistent widow and the unjust judge. Uh, and I want for this passage to help us to examine ourselves uh, and maybe to ask some intrusive questions of us. Now perhaps at times you might feel um, like I'm pushing the boundaries of this parable a little, um, but I do so only to prompt our thoughts, not to be any, uh, any heretical or controversial um, intention, but simply to help us examine our attitudes to prayer and indeed our practice of prayer. And so I want to frame it under two words, persistence and pursuit. So Luke 18 begins, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Now when a passage starts with then, it's only right that we cast our eye back over what's been happening before to see, well, what is it that has invited the telling of this parable? So in Luke 17, we see Jesus teaching about forgiveness and our need to build one another up, not to tear each other down or to make each other stumble. Um, to the disciples' request of Lord increase our faith, Jesus talks about how faith as small as a mustard seed can cause a mountain to move. There's a, an encounter with 10 lepers, all healed, but yet only one that's filled with thankfulness and praise for God. And then there's conversation recorded between Jesus and the Pharisees about the kingdom of God. A conversation that yet again talks about faith and faithfulness and indeed emphasises that God must be the first and foremost focus of our lives. It's into this setting of kingdom thoughts and faith challenges that Jesus tells the disciples a parable to show them that they should pray and never give up. So can it be that there's a link between persistent prayer, faith, and the kingdom of God? Well, let's consider the parable. There's two characters, the judge and the widow. What plays out is a legal court case where the widow is pleading her case before the judge, uh, as would have been a regular custom within the law and culture of that time. Now within Jewish culture, widows were vulnerable, having no husband to provide for them. And for this reason, the protection of widows and orphans was built in to the Jewish law. And so, so frequently throughout scripture, we witness God's care and compassion on those most vulnerable and how their mistreatment is totally unacceptable to God. Within this parable, the expected outcome should be that the judge shows fairness at the very beginning. It was part of the law. The very role and purpose of the judge was to exercise justice and fairness by the law. Yet this widow encounters a judge that exercises none of those virtues, who has disrespect for God and for the law and is more interested in his own self and comfort. But the widow does not relent. Uh, she is persistent in pleading her case before him, so persistent that her aggravation causes the judge to relent and to grant her the justice that she deserves. 
So let's consider the widow. Vulnerable, yet persistent. Not accepting of wrongs, but pushing and pushing for justice. Tenacious, you could say. It's her actions uh, that seem to be the teaching point of this parable that matches verse 1 about always praying and never giving up. For that's what's evidenced in her, this never giving up. Persistence pays off. And I'm sure we can think uh, about other personal, personal examples in our lives where um, we have evidence to the truth that persistence can pay off. Maybe it's about an increase uh, to your level of fitness or improvement in health and so persistence is called to keep pushing towards targets and goals. Maybe it's learning a new language or a new skill and the persistence of practice uh, increases your competency. Persistence pays. But in order for us to be persistent about something, well, we have to really care about it, don't we? Uh, if we don't care enough or see the point, then we fail or we quit easily. For the widow uh, in this parable, justice and restoration is so important to her that she keeps coming again and again before the judge until she receives the results that she deserves. So here's an intrusive question. Are we persistent and faithful in prayer? Do we hold the relationship we have with God with such value and necessity that it fuels our persistence to keep coming again and again and again? asking God to come to us again and again and again. Do we care enough to have the persistence that Jesus is inviting in us as we read this parable? In the parable, persistence pays. The woman gets the justice that she deserves. And Jesus points out that God, uh, that the God we come to, our judge, it is not to be compared to the unjust one in this parable. For our God is good and holy and just. He is a God of provision and love for his people. So if this woman can receive blessing from one who is corrupt, then Jesus says, how much more can we expect from our holy and just and good God? Now, often people have looked at this parable and gotten a little confused by the character of the judge. They forget that God is a, a contrast, not a comparison to the character of the judge and, and have therefore been, been guilty of seeing uh, God as, as this corrupt or changeable God. And so if we annoy him enough with prayer, then we can change his mind and get what we want. But I don't believe that's what the teaching of this passage is. And if we put it alongside Luke 11, where Jesus is also teaching about prayer, he makes the point that a God who is loving and just, um, God, that God is a father who is generous to his children. And so ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. However, does this mean that we should expect God um, to give us everything that we ask for just if we persist? Well, that takes me to my second word for this morning, pursuit. If we return to the parable, what lies at the heart of this interaction is justice and compassion. Could it be fair in light of the previous conversations about the kingdom of God and a growing faith that we read this called persistent prayer in light of prayer that beckons forth the kingdom of God? And so it's not a call to persistent prayer simply for our own personal interests or desires, but that our persistence should be to pray for God's kingdom to come. A kingdom of healing, a kingdom of justice, of compassion and mercy, of forgiveness and love. Could we look at the corrupt and unjust judge and see an image of a world around us that is broken and corrupt? A world that steps on the head of the vulnerable doesn't lift them up. A world that does not reflect the virtues of God's kingdom as revealed to us in scripture. 
Therefore, in the example of the widow, we hear a call to rise up in persistent prayer against the brokenness of this world, trusting that our God, our good God, will intervene and that his kingdom will most surely come. We should not accept the brokenness and corruption of this world. We should be persistent in how we push into it until God's justice and God's kingdom comes. And so our pursuit in prayer should be the kingdom of God and the values and attributes of that kingdom. As we pursue the kingdom of God, we pray into brokenness. We plead for wholeness and healing. We beg for provision and justice on those most vulnerable. And in such prayers, we find ourselves drawn deeper into the heart of God. And we find our lives becoming moulded into a response for the concerns of God. So an intrusive question that this train of thought might ask of us. Is the pursuit of our prayers for the benefit of the kingdom of God or for the gain of ourselves? It can be so easy for our prayer lives to become very self-focused. And yes, of course, we want to talk to God about the concerns and the worries of our hearts. For that is part of relationship. Uh, That's part of knowing him and him knowing us. But that cannot be our only focus or our only pursuit. Likewise, our prayers um, must pursue the kingdom of God to come alive then in our own hearts. And so that might mean that God answers our concerns or our worries in in different ways than we expect. But if our pursuit is the kingdom of God, then those answers will come in line with that, even if they are different than we expect them to be. And so we shouldn't lose heart, but keep praying for God's kingdom to come. We must remember that our pursuit of prayer is not to bring God into line with our way of thinking. Rather, to ask God through prayer that he might bring us further into line with his heart and his kingdom. Persistent prayer is not about changing God's mind like the unjust judge. Persistence prayer is calling God's kingdom to come for we know that kingdom is good and holy and just and right. This passage asks one further intrusive question. And in verse 8, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? This parable about the persistent widow, one which Luke frames as teaching the disciples about a call to pray and not give up. Well, it's a call to discipleship for each of us. It's a call that asks us uh, not to look around and point out the faithless or that we might judge them and say they're lost, but actually to examine ourselves and to ask, are we exercising a persistent faith that pursues the kingdom of God at all times? Do we have faith to believe that this kingdom is coming? Have we forgotten that we are to live out the values of this kingdom? Values that pursue justice, that abound in compassion and generosity, and that are rooted in unity and love. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Will he find faith in us? At the beginning, I asked the question, why was it important for Jesus to teach and guide and model prayer for his disciples? Well, prayer invited them into kingdom work. It was their relationship and lifeblood of God. It allowed them to stay in line and in tune with the Spirit of God to bring healing and wholeness to this world in the name of Christ. Why then is it important for us to exercise this discipline of prayer? Because prayer invites us into powerful kingdom work. It invites us to hear the heart of God and it beckons us to align our lives with his kingdom. So persist and pursue.
for to pray is to change, to change yourself, to change the brokenness of this world through the power of Christ. May we be persistent in prayer, persistent in the pursuit of the kingdom of God. That's our challenge this morning as we journey through Lent. So let us pray. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for this invitation to come and to meet with you in prayer. We thank you that it is a gift to us where we can come and we can talk to you and we can bring to you the concerns and the desires of our heart and know that you lovingly meet us in them. We thank you that prayer is also a gift that you give us to others as we pray on their behalf and as we bring their needs before you, trusting in your goodness and your mercy, in your healing and in your power. Lord, forgive us if we have lost sight of the power and the privilege of prayer. Forgive us if it has taken second place from busyness or needs that are in front of us. Forgive us if we have forgotten to withdraw to lonely places and pray just as Jesus did. Lord God, today will you help us to be renewed in our thinking about prayer. And Father, will you uh, renew and refresh our hunger to join and to partner with you in prayer in praying for your kingdom to come for this world. Father, we face injustice and brokenness on a daily basis. Yet we know that you're a God who heals and restores, a God who is holy and just. So Lord, as we come to prayer, help us not to be selfish with our intention, but rather God, help us to be people who persist and pursue after your kingdom. In how we pray, in how we claim it, in how we plead for it. And then Lord, in how we live that prayer out in our day-to-day -day lives. So renew us and restore us and call us into a deeper intimacy of prayer. Where in our prayers, we find ourselves coming in line with your heart and your kingdom. That it is less about ourselves and all about you. Call us in to a deeper hunger and a deeper knowledge, we pray today. Amen. As we come now to a time of intercession, um, I want us to realise that within us, we each have a gift to intercede and to pray for others, to pray for needs of those we know and to pray for needs that we have seen that exist around the world. Intercession is standing in the gap between an issue or a person and God and inviting God by his spirit to come and be at work. In a broken and uh, crumbling world at times, it is our greatest gift and weapon to stand in the gap for others. And so as we come to this time of intercession, I want to encourage you and allow you um, time to offer your own prayers. And so what follows will be um, words and images on your screen to a piece of music. Um, and I invite you to allow the Spirit of God to prompt you with those images or words and to prompt you to pray and to intercede for what he stirs up uh, in your mind and your heart. Remember, there is no correct words for prayer. There's just your honest conversation before God. So in this time of intercession, intercede, plead, stand in the gap for the needs that God has put on your heart. And as you pray, invite his kingdom to come. And as you pray, glimpse his heart for this world, a heart for love, a heart for goodness, a heart for justice, and pray with that same heart. So let's pray.
Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. Church, we need your power in us. We seek your kingdom first, we hunger and we thirst, refuse to waste our lives for your our joy and prize to see the captive hearts release, the hurt, the sick, the poor. Thank you for joining us in worship this morning. I hope that you have felt God's presence with you wherever you are this morning. And just to remind you that there is a Zoom Holy Communion straight after this service at 11 a.m. and you'd be most welcome to join us there. Other than that, we hope that you have a great Sunday, that you can enjoy whatever you're doing today. And so let us pray. God, go with us on our journey of faith. 
Revive us when we grow weary. Direct us when we go astray. Inspire us when we lose heart. Reprove us when we turn back. Keep us travelling ever onwards, a pilgrim people looking to Jesus Christ, who has run the race before us and who waits to welcome us home. And so let's share in the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.